after the tight confines of Winton and the Wild West show we remember as round five of the Shell Touring Car Nationals, the teams and drivers gather in Sydney this weekend for another edition of the V8 War Games. Winton will long be remembered for the outcome of BMW's weight concession, some fair dick and V8 aggression, and a few bits of driver depression. Nobody could lay a glove on Glenn Seaton or his Peter Jackson EB Falcon. He took the points while Cams took three grand from the hand of John Bow and Wayne Gardner for their contribution to the local panel beating industry. On the series leaderboard, Seaton has opened a 16-point break over sidekick Alan Jones, with Shell Teamsters Bow and Johnson a point apart in the battle for third. The Seven Network welcomes you to Sydney's fabulous Eastern Creek Raceway and the hottest act in motor racing. Round six of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championships. Proudly brought to you by Shell. Hello there, I'm Mike Raymond. Welcome to Sydney's fabulous Eastern Creek Raceway and round six of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship. Well, Fords have held sway for the previous five rounds of the championship, but Alan Moffat, I'm sure you will agree, the Holdens look a little better here today because of a new aero package. Yes, they certainly do, Mike. It's something the Holden drivers have been screaming for all year. A tough decision for cams, but uh, they've allowed them an aerodynamic package, something on the rear, a new wing on the rear, which is almost a copy of the Ford wing, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. as long as it sits between those two pylons that were originally homologated. Uh, fellows there from the Castrol team just uh, adjusting the stay in the middle. Here's the Holden racing team and the new lip on the front of the car. Well, Larry Perkins and all of the uh, Holden people are Thanks delighted. Glenn Seaton doesn't look that wrapped in it. But, of course, yesterday, the top six, Glenn Seaton was fast man, five one-hundredths quicker than John Bow, than Thomas Mazira. Peter Brock, fourth fastest, Mark Scaife, fifth, and sixth was Wayne Gardner in the Telecom Mobile Net Commodore. It wasn't the happiest days for Thomas Mazira, as you can see. The end of the front straight, flat strap, brakes on, but there's nothing there. And Thomas out towards the drag strip, concrete walls, tyres, just about everything. Managed to save it rode off a set of tyres and that affected him this morning. The draw for the Peter Jackson Dash, John Bow, fast time and down to Andy Raymond. And from position number two, it's JB ends up on pole position. Amazing, my luck's changed. The luck here at Eastern Creek with the Commodores right on your tail. Well, the Peter Jackson draw is just so much more important. Well, it is, yeah. It's uh, Obviously, it's nice. It's the first time I've had one this year, so... I hope I can capitalise on it, but at least it's, uh, it's a step in the right direction, isn't it? Thanks, Andy. And why wouldn't John Bauer be happy? Second fast qualifier yesterday moves to pole. Let's have a look at the amended starting lineup for the Peter Jackson Dash. Bauer and the Shell Falcon EV off pole. Jim Richards, the Winfield Commodore, alongside. Row number two, Mark Scaife, the second of the Winfield Commodores, out of position three. And Peter Brock, the Mobile One Commodore, starts out of four. From 5.16, Wayne Gardner, the Telecom Mobile Net Commodore. And rounding out the sixth, the man without any luck in the draw, car number 30, Glenn Seaton, the Peter Jackson Falcon EB. Getting ready. Green is out and bow. And Jimmy Richards head down the front straight past the Grand Strand into the left hand of Bow makes it. The Winfield car, second and third of Brocky poking the nose of the mobile Commodore down on the inside of Mark Scaife. As you can see, Glenn Seaton has already made up one spot as he has passed Wayne Gardner. There goes Gardner to the outside. He'll pay the penalty for that, or will he as Seaton closes it up? But Bow in front. Well, we saw Richards just thinking twice about darting under on the first corner but Bow managed the first corner and here leading the field. As a Jimmy Rich has done well out of this deal, he wasn't even in the dash yesterday afternoon, but Thomas Mazira flat spot on his tyres, he's been pushed out of the dash, Jim draw two, and now he's second position in the dash, he's done very well on Sunday morning. Seaton I don't think would be uh, very happy about giving him a start in the two championship heats today, let's see if Seaton has anything left in reserve as he unwinds the big Falcon, moves into the draft of Peter Brock, can he pass him before the left-hander? No, he can't. Brock's car running very strongly as they cut it down into turn number one. Well, we're seeing already the benefit of this new aerodynamic package for the Commodore. Seaton only one-tenth of a second faster than, faster than the fastest Commodore yesterday, which was Thomas Mazira. The uh, field really closing up at the front. The Ford Holt battle really on Leaston Creek for the first time. Oh, oh Gardner God. gets way out of shape there. Well, that's the second time through that corner. He's had difficulties. He won't want to do that too many times in the race. Downhill again, Bow still leading it. Jimmy Richards in second, Peter Brock third in the uh, Mobile 05, Holden Commodore, and Glenn Seaton looking for an inside pass, oh. and maybe affects it, yes he does. We little team up their best position this year. Jimmy Richards made a, a great start to the race, and Mark Scaife has moved to the second spot now. 
Glenn Seaton runs in third, Brock is fourth, Jim Richards is next, and Wayne Gardner closing all over the tail of Richards' number two car. And Gardner may be paying the penalty. Tyres not all that warm. It's a cool day here in Sydney. We're coming down to take the flag now with one lap to go. We'll see whether Mark Scaife has anything left in reserve to try and tackle John Bauer. There's the gap. Not too much in it. They take the white. One to go. I think you were right about John Bow being fired up, Mark. He's definitely uh, holding a lead here that uh, he's not uh, taking any chances about relinquishing. We said he said to do well at Easter Creek. We saw last year in the Sierra on his uh, final year. He got pole position. He ran very strongly against Longhurst in the GTRs. And once again this year, he's did a bonsai lap in qualifying. He's not too sure about the consistency of the Falcon in race trim, but uh, these three laps are a pretty good indication. They haven't let them down too badly this year. The man who has made up a lot of ground, Glenn Seaton, in this final lap of Eastern Creek and the Peter Jackson dash, the sixth round of the series. You'll notice on our next shot just how close Glenn Seaton gets to the tail of Mark Scaife and the Winfield Commodore as JB brings the Shell Falcon up into the final turn. And here is Seaton uh -huh. trying to catch the draft ride here. Right in, if he pulls another move like he did earlier, he's quite capable. There's enough distance between here and the flag. Well, he's shown no lack of bravery in these first two and a half laps. And there are a couple of points here where I guess, Alan, he might be able to squeeze the big falcon on the inside of Mark Scaife. I'm, I'm thinking about this left-hander up yep. here on the approach to the main straight. He might try and duck in there. Scaife not giving him too much room. And not near, neither should he. Well, they come up to the left-hander. He'll have to be closer to get into the draft and hope for a slingshot down the main straight. John Bauer, meantime, comes out of the last turn. of Falcons going to win round six of the Peter Jackson Dash, and here's JB. He'll make it, and Glenn Seaton just won't be able to park Mark Scaife. It is close at the finish, but Scaife will pick up the second, and that puts Glenn Seaton back to third and Peter Brock into fourth. Great driving from John Bauer. Let's go down to Andy Raymond. John, you haven't won a Peter Jackson dash for cash. That's certainly a nice way to do it here at Eastern Creek where the Commodores are so uh, competitive. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's about time my luck changed and I hope it's going to continue for the rest of the day. Glenn uh, made his way through the field, so obviously the Peter Jackson Fords have got a bit in reserve. Well, I think he's got a bit of pace on everybody in the field, really, so it's a matter of, you know, hanging in there in the race and uh, trying to drive uh, cleanly and not make any mistakes. I think that's the secret to it all. Well, a good start for John Bow, Alan Moffat, but a little work to do for Glenn Seaton. Well, yes, but Glenn's really got time on the board, and I think if we uh, look at the way he went through the field uh, at Winton last week, he's in with a show today for sure. But John could hold him off. Two exciting championship heats to come in the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship, but after the break, the bikes are back. A beautiful day in Sydney's West, Australia's Wonderland, right next door to Eastern Creek Raceway. Round six of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship today, and of course, the Shell Oil Superbikes. If you're ready for a little horsepower hankering, keep this in mind. Michael Dowson, Scotty Doohan, Roy Leslie, Troy Corsa, and fast qualifier Sean Giles start on the front row of the field. Anthony Gobert on the Winfield Honda out of six. Seven is Kirk McCarthy on the Suzuki. Eight is Robbie Phyllis on the Kawasaki. Nine, Ricky Rice. And out of ten, Michael O'Connor on the Team Kawasaki entry. Only seconds away from the start now as the flagman walks off the field. Last followed by a short Giles on the outside. Does he win the jump? You venture from the outside and hauls it across to the inside as they stoke it down into turn number one. Getting away to a brilliant start. I think Robbie Phyllis also got away to a fairly good start as well. Fabulous. Fabulous start from Sean Giles there. Had the choice of starting from the inside of the outside of the front row. And I guess the ideal racing line, at least at Creeks, on the right-hand side of the track. Plenty of rubber down there and giving him plenty of traction as he leapt away from the start on the uh, Yamaha. But he's been swamped on the first time through uh, to turn two. Fairly close out of there. Now the run downhill. And after getting away to a brilliant start, he left a little gap, I believe, open on the inside. And that was about all they needed from the Ducati team with Scotty Doohan and Roy Leslie up very smartly indeed. Also the Winfield team into the left-hander. Some, some heavy moves in the opening lap of this race. Roy Leslie there back in third position. Sort themselves out as they come through the tight twists and turns over the back part of the circuit. Ricky Rice there on the Suzuki coming up smartly through the pack as well. He would have handed it to Sean Giles heading down to the first corner because the start was superb. He 
Yeah, still got a lot of work to do now. Troy Corsa there on the Honda coming through smartly as well. Well, I don't think those Ducati boys are too worried about the first lap, Mike. They've got seven laps here at Eastern Creek to unwind that uh, marvelous power that the Ducati bike has got. Here's Michael Dowson carrying our GIR Australia race cam. This will give you an idea of the speed down the front straight. Just listen to the machine. 140 brake horsepower at 13,500 RPM. Lay it over. They really are kicking up an enormous amount of horsepower to this new Yamaha. Replacement for the venerable OWI1. The boys are a quick machine. Leslie coming under fire from bike 20. Sean Giles, the pole position man. Ducati's running an even more high-tech setup than we've seen before. An electronic gear change. Meaning that they don't even have to back off the throttle. Here's Scotty Doohan. Leads it on to Ducati. Back behind him, Sean Giles. And also coming through, Michael Dowson carrying that GIO Australia race cam. McCarthy is not too far back behind them too, so it's a fairly competitive race between uh, Yamaha, Honda, Kawasaki and Suzuki. And Robbie Phyllis, plate number 32, keep an eye on Robbie. He usually saves his best for last. Uh, he's got a lot of work to do <laughs> here today because the leaders are bold. Great start too from Ricky Rice, starting off ninth position on the grid on the Melbourne Suzuki. Beautifully prepared Phil Tainton machine and Phyllis. Phyllis. <laughs> We've seen him do it so many times. Oh, Ricky Rice grabs the ground back again, but Phyllis will be back on him very, very quickly. We've seen Robbie, one of the best racers of all time. Not a great qualifier, but look at this. All the uh, adrenaline, all the aggression comes out once that uh, green light goes. And we can expect big moves from Rob as they pick their way through the first of two superbike heats at Eastern Creek today. I found it interesting in the driver's press conference yesterday that all the other bikies uh, had quite a deal of respect for uh, Rob Phyllis coming through and uh, we're commenting on his uh, qualifying time being down a bit. He said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll watch what happens today. He's up to six at the moment, so, and he'll make, uh, he'll make life difficult here for, uh, for Sean Giles and the rest of them if he can just get on uh, racing terms with them. Still got a lot of work to do at the moment. Robbie Phyllis currently leading the Australian Road Racing Championships over Troy Corsa, Scotty Doohan in third, Kirk McCarthy in fourth, Michael Dowson in fifth, and Sean Giles rounding out six. So it's very tight at the top of the points table. There's one in trouble. See the number? I think it's 60, is it? Yeah, number 60. Rob Williams. Now, Mark, you mentioned horsepower for the uninitiated. How much horsepower do they have? Well, we're talking about 140 horsepower. Well, uh, the Japanese bikes what, are... Uh, five Volkswagens? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly about three Formula Vs. Yes. Which gives you some idea of just how, uh, how much power these guys are sitting on top. Leading it through or a, single, controlling, yeah. a single rear tyre. Uh, wheel rim widths on the back getting up to six inches now, which gives you an idea of just how much rubber they're putting on the road. And uh, when you consider a Grand Prix bikes putting out about 170 brake horsepower, they're not too far off and a, and a great training ground uh, for upcoming Grand Prix stars. Well, the circuit was built for uh, motorbike racing with the Grand Prix coming once a year. It's three laps to go this time as they come past the start finishing lines. Great scrap this. Troy Corsa really putting a lot of pressure. Sean Giles. Scotty Doohan and Roy Leslie looking good for a one-two here for the Ducati team. Well, oh, you can't put a Ducati driver down, Mike. You know that. And it's fabulous. They sound marvellous. They go past the grandstand here. Sean Giles, fast qualifier, runs in third. Right behind him, Troy Corser on the Winfield Honda. Haven't well, they been hard at it? Honda team as we take GIO race cam aboard Michael Dowson's Yamaha. Once again, to the screen of the superb. Once again, look at the 45 degree angle to the road <laughs> is what I'm looking at. Great pitches. Here we go, one side to the other. Left-hander up the back straight. Dowson up to fifth. There's a lot of air though between he and fourth. Tremendously physical machines to ride. You see on and off the power, feeding it in. It's a tricky little left-hander. That one's tough for the cars there. They have to brake quite considerably. There's Scotty Doohan. Still leading, but Roy Leslie's getting closer. A battle between the uh, Ducati boys. Head up to the top part of the circuit. 
Scott Derwin still troubled by an injured knee for the Winfield Triple Challenge in January. Apparently he's got a knee operation coming up for, or a knee construction coming up, so that might be, uh, or maybe weighing on his mind a bit. It's not affecting his speed. Leading his team boss, 36-year-old Roy Leslie. Leslie's going to make a move down on the inside and he'll take the lead away. Fabulous sound from the two Ducatis. Do it. Well, Scott Dewan's taken to the Ducati like a duck to water. He gave it its first win in the Australian Superbike Championship at Wanneroo recently in round four. So Let's third up Scotty, no end of two. <laughs> Absolutely. Roy Leslie, uh, he's only getting one more shot at this. Sean Giles runs there in third, and right behind him is Troy Corser on the Winfield Honda. If anything, they've closed up a little bit. Yeah. The uh, Honda team getting some help from the Honda Racing Company in Japan. Factory help by way of new cylinder heads, uh, new front brakes, suspension, these new six-inch wide rims. So throwing more and more new parts at the RC30 to keep it competitive. And it certainly seems to be doing the trick at Eastern Creek. Corser's been trying to dive down the inside of Giles, but... Uh, couldn't affect a pass there. They continue to gain a little on the leaders, as you can see. Out of the right-hander, the exit to Corporate Hill. This is the battle for uh, third and fourth. Yeah, same before, the Ducati's using this high-tech electronic gear change, which means they don't have to back off the throttle. They just hold the throttle open and bash the change through without having to pull a clutch lever or back off on the throttle. The engine automatically dies just for a fraction of a second so it can pick up its next cog. Gee, that's so, the Ducati's with their uh, engine management system and fuel injection are really uh, the most high-tech bikes in the superbike world at the moment. Last lap board coming up now. Let's see whether Roy Leslie can make a move. He starts to close a little on doing as they come down the straight. And just look at Sean Giles gaining on the pair of them. One to go. Once again, it's Italy versus Japan. This new Yamaha, big power. Lots of grunt out of the corners, the guys have been telling me. Hard under brakes, has a look down the inside of Roy Leslie. Certainly thinking about it. Haven't they bunched up on this last lap? This is going to be an exciting final turn. Plenty of corners in front before the flag. Two Ducatis lead the Yamaha and the Honda. Great finish coming up here. Scotty doing, doing a great job here today at Eastern Creek. Roy Leslie has kept him honest, though, his team partner. He might be just covering the tracks at the moment, though. Giles came from nowhere, made a big move into the second turn, has been unable to capitalise on it. Now it gets horribly tight. They swing out of here on the run to the next right-hander. Giles perfectly positioned here. He sure is. Ducati, Ducati, Yamaha and Honda. That's the order of the leading quartet. Hard under brakes, what a fabulous movie. Oh, actually, there's a bit of contact there. Definitely. Well, Leslie, I think, might have got an elbow on the side and a bit of a fairing on the side of his own elbow. And Corsa was looking to make that a twosome through there. Oh, that was aggressive stuff from Giles, but he's pulled it off. Can do and hang on to the lead here as Giles closes up. I think he probably will. Exit the final turn. Leslie comes to the inside again to try and make a challenge. It'll be Scotty Doohan coming down. Not too much between them at the finish, but Doohan will make it. Giles gets second. And Roy Leslie will pick up the third. And they can go back and have a little debate about whose elbows were involved. <laughs> wow, what a race. Scotty Doohan wins the Show Oil Superbike race over Sean Giles. Roy Leslie places third. Troy Corsa fourth. And Michael Dowson fifth. And we'll be back at the creek in just a moment. Welcome back to Eastern Creek Raceway. Round six of the championship about to unfold. Cars on the grid, but a drama already for the Dick Johnson team. Dick is in the pits, and with him is Andy Raymond. Yeah, terrible luck for Dick Johnson. Dick, a broken rear axle. Yeah, Andy just uh, drove out the uh, pit lane, obviously, from the, uh, the hit the car took on Friday. It's, uh, you know, with the diff housing being bent the way it is, the car hasn't been that, all that perfect all weekend, so... It's now broken an axle, I'd say. Either that or strip the spine out of the uh, out of the diff. The guys are working feverishly behind us. What's going to happen? Are you be going to be able to get out for the first race? No, I got a fairly good sort of a feeling. I just might be a spectator. I mean, 
Bad luck there for Dick Johnson. Let's take a look at the lineup. John Bauer to start off pole position by virtue of winning the Peter Jackson dash. Mark Scaife out of position two. Glenn Seaton is out of three in the Peter Jackson Falcon. Four and zero five. Peter Brock, the mobile Commodore. And from five, 16, Wayne Gardner, the Telecom Mobile Net Commodore. From position number six, two, Jimmy Richards, the Winfield Commodore. From seven, 35, Alan Jones. Eight is 11, Larry Perkins, the Castrol Commodore. Dick Johnson, a non-starter, was to have started from nine. Out of position number 10, 25, Tony Longhurst, the Benson and Hedges BMW. Neil Crompton in car number seven starts out of 11 in the GIO Commodore from 1223 Paul Morris, the Diet Coke BMW. 13 is 20, John Blanchard, the B&H BMW. 1424 Jeff Full in the Diet Coke BMW and 15 is 33, Bob Pearson, the Product Commodore. 1627 Terry Finnegan, the Food Town Commodore from 17-3 is Trevor Ashby in the Lansvale Smash Repairs Commodore from 1812, Bob Jones, the Ampole Max 3 Commodore. 1946 Michael Donaher in the Commodore VL from 2038, Brett Yulden in the Car Trek Commodore. 21 is 39, Chris Smerton in the Commodore from 22 is 22, John English in the Commodore VN. 23 is 36, Neil Shembry in a Commodore VP and from 24, 53, Peter Doolman is in the Impala Kitchens BMW. From 25, 6 is John Smith in the Caltex Corolla. From 26, 8, Colin Bond, the Caltex uh, Corolla Seeker. From 27, 42, Glenn Mason in a Commodore. 28 is 52, John Cotter in an M3 Motorsport BMW. 29, 79 is Mike Conway in the Toyota Corolla. Corolla and Frank Binding in the Corolla starts out of position number 30. Only a couple of other additions to that, Brad Stratton and in a Corolla and Bob Holden starts out of position number 33. And here's the man with a lot of work to do, Thomas Mazira starting dead last in the field today after flat spotting tyres yesterday. And he has quite an assignment in front of him, something like uh, 32 other cars to pass. Beautiful day here at Eastern Creek in Sydney. Mike Raymond along with Mark Osler and Alan Moffat. Hope you enjoy round six of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championships. Jesus, Bauer. John Bauer creeping over the line and he gets off the line but Scaife gets off sideways with him and Seaton down the inside and Peter Brock tries to open them up as well. Seaton will lead this. Yes, he does into the first turn. Out of the second row. Fantastic stuff as they all haul through turn number one, the short straight up to the second left-hander. John Bowen's gone back a spot, and Alan Jones has made a remarkable start. Down the inside, wouldn't even uh, by betting Jones will come out of there running about four. Well, it doesn't matter what John Bow does now, Mike, if uh, he doesn't get a minute penalty for uh, jumping the start. It's a, it's a savage ruling, but uh, that's no worse than a Formula One champion gets creeping on the line. I, I can't see that he won't get penalised for that. Well, that was a sensational start from Seaton, but Mark Scaife just got swamped off the line. I'm not sure there's a mechanical problem there. He done at the start, and we can't see him in the backpack. There, there he is, Mark Scaife out of the race. Great shame for the Winfield team, looking very strong in qualifying, and he hasn't got more than 100 metres. It's pretty strong up the front half of the field. Glenn Seaton got away smartly. John Bauer runs in second. Then I think it's uh, Wayne Gardner up through the pack into about third. Thomas Mazira still trying to clear the field, but he's made up a lot of ground. There's the gap Gardner going through. Alan Jones is next, followed by Perkins, Longhurst, Brock, then Jim Richards and Neil Crompton. But Glenn Seaton got away absolutely beautifully off the line, down the inside, to lead them going into the first turn. That'll be a huge weight off Glenn Seaton's mind. He was pushed to number six in the Peter Jackson dash for cash earlier this morning. Fought his way up to third position, blasted him off the line. Now he's back to his rightful position, and he'd be wrapped leading them across the line for the first time. Bow in second crowd. position. Crowd absolutely standing as one, cheering on Glenn Seaton as he hauls down into the first turn, opening that gap. There's Alan Jones in the second of the Peter Jackson Falcon EVs, going through Wayne Gardner, is just ahead of him as we pick up on the leader coming up to turn number two. Expect some big moves from Alan Jones in the opening laps of this heat. Had a disappointing practice, only qualified eight. Mysteriously dropped off half a second somewhere in qualifying yesterday. But as you see from AJ, in so many heats of the Touring Car Championship this year, he will charge. The VH really flying at Eastern Creek. The top eight cars covered by less than one second. The top 12 cars under the existing lap record, which is phenomenal speed. There's Tony Longhurst, BMW, of course, also getting uh, a handout with the... Uh, Performance Review Committee of CAMS. As you get your rear spoiler, Alan. See the big lip on the back of the BMW there, Mike, that additional almost uh, four or five inches make a tremendous dis dip, uh, advantage on the corners and uh, a big advantage at a, a circuit like Bathurst. Here's Wayne Gardner down Ooh. to the outside, trying to faint just now. He'll tuck it back on the inside coming out of the turn. So Gardner 
In car number 16, the Telecom Mobile Net Commodore is up to challenge John Bow already, and Alan Jones is looming just behind Gardner. Boy, is Wayne Gardner on fire this weekend. He was fastest in qualifying or the uh, early practice session on Saturday morning until he had that spectacular diff blower. But he's really enjoying the circuit and, and thoroughly enjoying this new aerodynamic package the Commodores are running. Feeling very strong in the car. Yes. I feel sorry for two people this weekend. One has got to be Thomas Mazzera, the other has to be Dick Johnson. They come down the front straight away. And there is the gap between John Bow and Wayne Gardner on the move. Mark Scaife out of this race. Let's go down to Andy. Yeah, terrible luck for Mark Scaife breaking a tail shaft as he went into second gear on the start. Mark, how do you explain something like that? Well, this is one of those things, you know, like a lot of the other holding competitors, a lot of the other competitors in the cars have the same sort of problem. We just got a good jump and, and went to second gear and it broke. So that's, that's the game we're in. Dick's already a spectator in the first one. Now you're here. Can we rectify it for heat two? No problem. Yeah, we'll be there for sure. Thank you, Andy, and Mark Scaife. Wayne Gardner down on the inside of John Bauer. Oh, you better be careful. He's not going to... Uh, he's not going to get away with a move like that on John Bauer without uh, just a little bit more room in front of him. And that is one of the Caltech's uh, Corolla sitting back parked on the side of the racetrack. Not a great weekend for the two leader boys, and, of course, the five leaders get well and truly away from them on a horsepower circuit like Eastern Creek. Yep, there he is. Well, and that's the number six car. Sad to see uh, John Smith out of the race so early. Gardner again coming down the outside. This really is crunch time for the whole boys this weekend. Glenn Seaton's already opened up a healthy gap on John Bauer. Wayne Gardner, they're splitting the Ford pack, but there's Falcons 1, 2 and 4 in these opening laps. I think it's a pity that we're missing Scaife and obviously missing Mazzera. Uh, John Bauer might not be feeling so healthy if he had two more Commodores around him, but it's uh, fair to say that Wayne Gardner is savaging the Shell Falcon at the moment but not just quite capable of sliding by. He's got a tough man to pass. And look, he's into the draft. Tucks under the rear spoiler of the Falcon. He wants to pass him. It'll have to be down pit lane. They go by the grandstand. Oh. And Wayne uh, Gardner still sits in behind John Bauer, but closing on them already is Alan Jones. He's the next one through. Peter John. Brock, Larry Perkins. Nothing out there, Wayne? No, you won't be able to get... Look at Alan Jones. He's just catching them hand over fist. Peter Jackson Falcon on a, on a charge, as we've seen in so many rounds before. Alan Jones moved up for this battle for fourth. And these are three very tough customers. Seaton gets away from them. Downhill, here comes John Bauer. Gardner go. on the inside. Tried it the last lap. Let's see what happens. There's Peter Brock running very competitively this weekend in the Mobile One Commodore. And I think where Wayne's missing, he's got the arm out the window. <laughs> He's from the Peter Brock Advanced Driving School of yeah, catch, you can, catch their attention. You can wave all you want. The best place for your hand, uh, whether you're on the highway or on the racetrack, is both hands on the wheel. But the thing is, down the front straight, Wayne can't do anything horsepower-wise because John Bow just has that edge. He slips down here. He's going to leave a little gap here. Alan Jones will take uh, full advantage of it. It's a little taily out of there. Warm up the tyres. Jones coming up. Larry Perkins looking strong there in the Castrol VP Commodore. Peter Brock is not too far behind him. This is going to be the big test of this new package with the Commodore. See how consistent they are in race trim. We've seen a lot of speed from them, particularly in the dash for cash. But whether they can hang in there for 16 laps is the big question, because the Fords have certainly proved their race consistency in the opening uh, five rounds. I, I don't think you could say that uh, Gardner's doing a bad job of it at the moment, but here comes Jones. He's slipstream Gardner. Oh. Proud love that. They thought that was wonderful. So Jones is on the move. Mazera is up to position 16 from 33, the rear of the field. Peter Jackson team conducted a very uh, progressive two-day tyre test here a couple of weeks ago. Putting more and more work in on the chassis. And certainly you talk to someone like John Bauer, who just cannot get over the uh, traction of these cars out of corners. They've tried everything they can with the shell cars to try and match it. But these Peter Jackson cars have so much bite coming out of the turns. And a track like this, that's a huge advantage. Well, the tyre companies aren't lying still any more than the car companies are, and uh, Bridgestone supporting Glenn Seaton's team, uh, Dunlop on the uh, Shell cars, uh, a battle between the two tyre companies, Yokohama on uh, Fred Gibson's teams on the two Winfield cars. We'll take our Mobile One race cam as we ride with Peter Brock, the Mobile One Commodore. Brock now runs sixth on the road, just missed uh, staying in the draft of the leaders, but he's been fairly consistent. Larry Perkins got by him. And it's those Lowry and Brocky are certainly making up a lot of ground on the back of Wayne Gardner's car. So this leading six is becoming a very tight bunch indeed in the opening laps. As you can see the freight train clearly through Brocky's windscreen. And you can see it too. And right behind him, 
we take the front air dam of our seven sport race cam. This is riding on Tony Longhurst's <laughs> BMW. This is one of the most evocative views of motorsport you'll ever see. You couldn't get much closer to the ground. And here the snarl of that little BMW four-cylinder revving its head off. 9,500 RPM. Gets rocks and dirt thrown in his face to the bargain. And Tony Longhurst, a great turn of speed at uh, Eastern Creek this weekend. Just look at this on the main straight. That's a V8 in front of him. It's not exactly walking away. And it's what we can expect at Bathurst. BMWs, a flock of them, probably a dozen of them, will arrive out of the air. Be like the Luftwaffe. <laughs> Longhurst up to position number seven in the field. There's Brock looking to the inside of Larry Perkins. They exit turn number two. They come up on one of the slower two leader cars. He hangs to the left side of the racetrack. There's the view inside uh, Brock's Mobile One. Just see the way that 1,000 kilo BMW just murders the V8s under brakes. There he is making up a lot of ground on Peter Brock. Brock is going to be under fire very, very shortly. The cornering speed of the BMW, Mark, their handling package is just superb. They've worked on this car. I don't know how many years now this body shape has been their flagship for motor racing, but it's at the, the end of the line now. But the amount of technology that is in that car will be nothing short of uh, Cape Canaveral standard. And a credit to their team, a credit to their engineering. I, I do compliment them on that aspect. They run down by Corporate Hill into the right hand of Larry Perkins. Brock closes on him under brakes. Wayne Gardner just ahead of him. Tony Longhurst just behind Brock. And then it's Jimmy Richards in the Winfield Commodore car number two. These two pilots, Larry Perkins and Peter Brock, have played a big part in uh, putting this new Holden aerodynamic package together, along with the Winfield team, Freddie Gibson's input as well. I think it's fair to say that without the combined uh, mutual efforts of uh, all the Holden teams, uh, the CAMS uh, governing body wouldn't have been uh, uh, swayed by their argument. It, it has been a unified case that's been put forward by the Holden CAMP to produce these new wings. Let's check them out, how they run on our show race score. Glenn Seaton leads the pack over John Bowers, Falcon, Falcon OEB. Alan Jones runs third in the Peter Jackson Falcon, followed by Wayne Gardner. Larry Perkins rounds out the five, and we're back at the creek for a beat in just a sec. Almost half distance now as they come out of uh, Corporate Hill Turn. Larry Perkins, Peter Brock. That'll give you an idea of the queue. Tony Longhurst sits in there. And right behind Tony Longhurst is, of course, Jimmy Richards in the Winfield Commodore. It is interesting, Mike, since Winton, when the big hefty fines, the $3,000 fines were handed out, that we, we're not missing one bumper bar or one spoiler in this race. It's about the first race we've had this year where all the cars are intact. Early days, Alan. Well, I, I hope I haven't spoken too soon. And the other thing, of course, a, a track like this in Eastern Creek where horsepower does come into play, you can always expect a bit of that roughhouse stuff on a very short track like Winton or uh, Amaru Park. True. But here, you don't really want to touch anyone at the end of the straight, as you saw at the head of the program with Thomas Mazira sliding off here in uh, practice yesterday. And Dick Johnson uh, being uh, beset with problems on Friday when uh, he and Larry Perkins tangled in a practice session. Well, Glenn Seaton certainly controlling the pace from the front. It's just putting a time of 34.9, so he's about one and a half seconds off his qualifying pace. Qualifying running particularly cold conditions yesterday, 15 or 16 degrees. It's a little bit warmer today, but track temperatures are down. Rock up to position number six. Longhurst is seven behind him. We'll take bumper cam for you folks at home. Look at this. And this is a five-litre V8 in front of uh, the BMW. And Longhurst will be looking to the inside. He can just get a shot at them here. He loses out on uh, acceleration, but I tell you what, he doesn't lose out by much. Watch this. Now, you would expect the V8 to run away from Absolutely. it, but it's not. No. And this is what all the uh, five-litre competitors have been talking about. The, the new uh, rear wing on the Longhurst car was not homologated for use in Australia last year. On that basis, the car was allowed to run in 93. That was as it finished 92. So uh, CAMS have decided to give it a, a little more balance which would uh, enable the motor racing uh, manager Tim to be shanking all over today because he has a team of people hot after him. Now, this is your critical Bathurst form guy. You talk about Conrad Strait. Tony Longhurst didn't get much further than 50 or 60 metres behind Brock there. He's sitting in his toe. Uh, they'll be able to gear the car at any speed they want for Bathurst, which for this formula, I suspect, will be about 285 kilometres an hour on, uh, on Conrad. And uh, that little yellow BMW is going to be sitting just the way it is now. 
they'll run easier on fuel. They won't have to make the same number of pit stops. The V8s are very thirsty. I predict at least five stops for a V8 at Bathurst. And uh, certainly the Longhurst team is in with a show. Oh, yes, it'll be a very, very close and exciting contest. Thomas Mazzero started dead last position, 33 now, up to 12. So he's done some fine driving, as Thomas Mazzero. That's a great, That's great. Good to see Thomas having a run. He, he has had a lot of mishaps and uh, not always his own doing in practice. The interesting thing here, Alan, is that Alan Jones made up so much ground on Wayne Gardner. Gardner has sat here on the tail of Jones ever since. And Jones hasn't been able to go on with John Bauer. No. And if anything, the field is coming up onto the tail of Jones, not onto the tail of, uh, of John Bauer. Exactly. It's interesting, monitoring the lap time. Sick doing a high 134. Well, Paul Morris has put in a 134.6 in the little cake BMW. It's an idea of the comparative speeds when they get locked up in this uh, aerodynamic train. And there's some fast little German bimmers down the back there. Glenn Seaton keeping his unique record here at uh, Eastern Creek Raceway intact. He won both legs of the uh, Winfield Triple Challenge here at the start of the year. Such has been the dominance of the Peter Jackson team. They've won nine of the 12 touring car races held this year, including the Triple Challenge. Give you some idea of just how on form the two Peter Jackson Falcons have been. And just realise one thing there, Mark. You have to prepare the cars to win. They don't just get out there and run automatically. The crew that have uh, put these cars together and maintained them and Bo Seaton who's worked on the engines has done a superb job. You never win by accident. Yeah, you never win by good luck. You have to have a tremendous management skills and you have to have some superb drivers and certainly Glenn and Alan Jones have done the job for the team. We're coming up into some slower traffic here. I think uh, the first of the two leader cars to the right there uh, Dorman's uh, Impala Kitchens at BMW. It's been a pretty lonely old chase for him during the course of the season as well. A credit to him, Mike. He took on the job. He was one of the few that put his hat in the ring for the two-liter uh, class and said, uh, I'll do the championship. And with uh, Impala Kitchens, has been out there every round. Uh, he's got my vote. He certainly has. OK, let's take a look at this. This Whoa. is Tony Longhurst as Brocky gets it around in front of him. Longhurst backs it out but able to straighten it up. And Brock goes back one spot in the pack. Here they come across the line. Gardner trying to set Alan Jones up for a pass down the inside, but Jones is a bit too cagey for all that stuff. Well, we saw these two come together at Simmons Plains in the second round of the championship. No holds, but uh, Jones showed him what touring car racing was all about pretty swiftly. Wayne's got a little bit more experience up his sleeve now, and he's uh, taking the battle off to Jonesy once again. I think he's done a fabulous job, Wayne Gardner. Sure has. He came in, he was a little aggressive to start with, and that aggression was tempered by an old pro, Alan Jones, at uh, Simmons Plains. A couple of things went wrong for him with engine blow-ups at uh, Lakeside. He returned to Monaco to take a few weeks off. And speaking to him just before the race, he said he was staying at home. He's going to go testing with the Holden Racing team and do as much as he possibly can. Well, that's the wisest thing he can do. You're not going to go get going any faster uh, sitting on a beach in Monaco. That really is central to the Wayne Gardner story. He told me yesterday he hasn't had one uh, separate test session the whole time he's uh, been under contract with Holden. So he's certainly looking forward to getting down to some serious testing uh, after Eastern Creek. Now look at Longhurst now. He's moving up right behind uh, Alan Jones. So the 25 car comes Holden. up behind Wayne Gardner. Yeah, holding off the Castro VP. So he's been able to get past uh, Larry's car and Peter Brock. And Brocky's car. So Wayne Gardner's getting pretty uh, oversteery through some of these corners. So the tyre's getting a bit hot on the Telecom Holden. And the uh, tyre's Long being better nick on the BMW, I'll tell you. Longhurst will be licking his lips, I guarantee you. He won't even know he's got tyres on it, Mike. Well, we've got five laps to go still. There's still quite a bit of real estate to cover, and Longhurst is making enormous ground through here. The status quo remains, though. Falcons, one, two, three. Glenn Seaton leading John Bow and Alan Jones. Wayne Gardner holding the Holden Ford in fourth. And Tony Longhurst rounds out the five. Remarkable effort. To the left-hander at the end of the long straight here at Eastern Creek. The little buzz bomb, the BNH BMW 25 Tony Longhurst starting to come up on the tail of some of these big V8s. Into turn number two, there's John Bow going out of there. Alan Jones, the 35 PJ car, and Wayne Gardner right behind him. As Gardner's w stopped wasting his time uh, trying to overtake cars on that corner, he's uh, keeping his own line and uh, actually maintaining a better position on the road. As you saw the 
a gap then between uh, our race leader Glenn Seaton back to uh, John Bauer. It was considerable. We take the uh, the spoiler cam on the front of um, Tony Longhurst's car as he comes up on the tail here of Wayne Gardner. How close do you like your motor racing? A little bit of uh, overrun there. A smoke coming out of those uh, hold, uh, Chevrolet engines in the Holden team. Uh, nothing to worry about just when the driver takes his foot off the gas. The oil seeps by the rings and uh, gives it a little bit of a puff out there. It's one way, to, one way to tell when he's got his foot on the gas, isn't it? And but Larry, who they uh, dropped off earlier, is coming back into it again. So Tony trying to set up the right part of the racetrack to have a shot here at Wayne Gardner. I don't think it'll be the straight. He'll nip him in a corner. Here we go. Uh, he closed that option off very smartly. And he's trying to get a, a, a free toe down the straight and then jump out. But uh, I think Wayne's awake to this. He'll move to the inside. They'll have four laps to go as they come across the line. One of the slower cars there... Uh, just yeah. separating them and Colin Bond moving up to lead the two-litre class at the moment in the uh, Caltex Toyota Corolla. No shortage of horsepower from the Holden Racing Team Commodore. I think Fred Gibson, one of their customers, was speaking in the region of 560, 570 horsepower. Which is pretty phenomenal for an engine with a 10 to 1 compression ratio and 7,500 RPM rev limit. And Longhurst has a look down the inside. He's giving Gardner plenty and Gardner he working really very, does. very hard. This is extremely hard to drive at this point too. I mean, you can imagine it's all right for us to say back off a little bit, Tony. You might hit that bumper bar. But he's uh, the, the full bonnet length of the car away from that bumper bar. To judge this sort of uh, tactics here, he's having another, he might not quite... <laughs> He's doing a superb job. We have to hand it to Tony Longhurst. He won the BMW Driver of the Year. Is going to Spa later in the year in uh, August, uh, middle of August, to drive with the BMW team. And uh, we wish him well in that job. 24 hours around Spa will give him plenty of uh, practice, and he'll come back wound up, ready for Bathurst. We won't be able to put up with him, unfortunately. <laughs> Round six of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship. And Thomas Mazzera moves up on the tail of Neil Crompton. I think he's given him about 10 or 14 cars start in the field. And Thomas is hauling the mile. Look at this for horsepower. The GIO car feeling the brunt of a little more poke from Thomas Mazzera. So Crompton goes back one in the pack, tries to sit in behind Thomas, but Mazzera has done a fabulous job from the back of the field. Well, there's no questioning that the Chev engines have got more power, Mike. Uh, the GIO team just uh, in the process of getting their Chev engines together, holding them back for the latter part of the season, and a wise decision too, but you could see there from Mazzera to uh, nail Crompton in a straight line uh, was nothing but sheer horsepower. And this is the track custom made for a BMW M3. You can see these constant radius corners really loading the V-ups. They tip sideways, all that weight goes on the outside, then the inside tires. And then keep in mind, this is only the first of a 16 lap here. We've got another one coming up later on in the afternoon. And that's when Longhurst is going to be looking in even more menacing form. There's yes, Brocky yeah. going through, and 23 is Paul Morris right behind him in the Diet Coke BMW. Switches the outside. And now we'll try and tighten up the bender's gun. Oh, uh, lights up go. the bags. Oh, there we go. He's getting side, more and more sideways out of the corner each time they come through. It's called power oversteer, but in lay terms, just fishtailing. We've all done it on some street somewhere or other in our youth. I won't admit to where. Look at this. Look at Longhurst's body. If he just have found a little gap there, he would have made a telecom oh. mobile net. Nice one, Chucky. <laughs> <laughs> he gets out of the turn. One lap to go. Glenn Seaton leads them across the line. It's out to five car lengths over John Bauer. Four back to Alan Jones. Next is Wayne Gardner. Tony Longhurst is the next in the queue with Larry Perkins closing on him. Look at the speed through this corner. He's actually gaining on the V8 in front of him. Tony takes that corner wide. Oh. Uh, tough the luck for Neil. GIO Australia uh, Commodore has uh, gone out into the... Uh, Terminal. No finish zone, so that's bad luck for Neil. He was very quick here on Friday and had problems yesterday. Thought that they, I think they were about fifth or sixth fastest here on Friday and dropped out to 12th yesterday. They're on the final lap. And meanwhile, behind this pack, Paul Morris is uh, climbing all over the back of Peter Brock's Commodore. Keep in mind that only Longhurst and Morris's car have the full aerodynamic kit with the big splitter on the front spoiler and the big wing. The other two haven't been provided with them yet. So uh, they're on the plane from uh, yeah. Germany as we speak. Let me give you Tony and Paul just a little bit more advantage. The Ronnie Meacham will be picking them up at the airport. They're heading down to the next right hander. And here they come down now. Now this will be the critical corner as they swing around the 180 degree hairpin. Because Longhurst has been monstering him here under brakes as he's doing this time. But if Wayne gets Locked really sideways here and loses some speed, no, much cleaner exit there. So Wayne's picked up on that uh, opportunity. Wayne's not going to let him in there. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think that Holden will still always have that 
uh, accelerated rate, but uh, it's under brakes where longers can be such a pain. Here's the man that's nominated the Shell Australia Touring Car Championship so far, Glenn Seaton, wrapping up another one, doing it beautifully. And the crowd in the grandstand think this is fabulous. Seaton across the line leads John Bauer by three car lengths. Alan Jones finishes in third. Fourth is Gardner. Fifth is Tony Longhurst. Six would be Larry Perkins, followed by Peter Brock. A fabulous drive to Glenn Seaton. And that was a good race. Seaton, the race winner over John Bauer. Alan Jones, third. Wayne Gardner, fourth. And Tony Longhurst, the giant killer, was fifth. Welcome back to Eastern Creek Raceway. Formula Ford's coming up a little later in the program this afternoon. But right now, Glenn Seaton must be the most delighted touring car driver in Australia. He's put more points on the board in the championship. And with him in pit lane, it's down to Andy Raymond. Well, Team Peter Jackson just continues to dominate this series so far. 13 heats, 10 wins, and the leader of the team, Glenn Seaton, you must be happy. I really am, Andy, because um, especially the dash this morning, I drew six again this weekend and um, sort of came back to third. But, no, it's really down to credit for the team. The guys have worked fairly hard at the end of last year to get this, uh, to get it all organised for this year, and we've done that. And um, I just hope there's no more rule changes. Still 16 laps to go, a long way from home. Are those Holden's going to be much of a challenge in the second heat? Well, anything can happen from now on, Andy, because it depends on who's looked after their tyres just then. Um, and it's a matter of if John Bell looked after his tyres. He could be in trouble for the next race, but we don't know. And um, it's, it's really down to who looked after their tyres. Formula Ford's on the racetrack now for round six of the Motorcraft Driver to Europe Series. Stephen Ellery on pole position. Let's have a look at them quickly. Ellery out of pole. Stephen Richards from two. Craig Lowndes from three. Leif Corbin starts out of four. And Gavin Monaghan out of five. From six, it's Stephen White over Andrew Reid. Michael Dutton, Ponta Paris, and Mark Noski rounding out the ten. We're ready to go racing. And about to run now in the Motocraft Formula 4 Driver to Europe Championship round at Eastern Creek. A good-looking field. And actually, Stephen Ellery in 15 was just a little slow to start off the grid as they pound down the front straight looking for the first left hand. I think it was Craig Lowndes who got off to a pretty smart start through turn number one and on the uh, short straight now to uh, turn number two, the second of the left handers. And it's held a skelter down on the inside. Everyone on the brakes and safely uh, through turn number two. Settling down, Lance, as I said, got off to a pretty good start. Ellery was just a little slow off the mark, and Stephen Richards also got away quite smartly. I don't yeah. mind leaving their braking late, these guys, but uh, as I sweep around the back part of the circuit for the first time, Stephen Richards got shuffled back in the pack, qualified second fastest, very tight in qualifying, as we've come to expect from Formula 4, the top 11 cars covered by less than a second, but surprisingly, Stephen Ellery's pole position about half a second slower than Cameron McConville's uh, qualifying time from last year, so not as quick, maybe the cold conditions had something to do with them qualifying, but they're right into it now. Well, it's a pity to throw away pole position. Elroy didn't get a good start, and uh, he's paying the penalty now. Second place, not exactly the worst place in the world to be. But uh, drivers that get up onto the front row have got to learn to be able to take advantage of that pole position. But in the lead at the moment, Lowndes. Richards back there to, uh, to third. But just look at the snarling pack behind him as they come up to the right-hander. Big field, 29 starters in this uh, round of the Motocraft Driver to Europe Series. Stephen Ellery, the fast man in qualifying. Pushed back to second position here. We've got eight laps of this long circuit that goes in plenty of time. Look at this crocodile chain as they form a big aerodynamic string down the main straight. Ellery gets the toe side by side as they head down toward this really fast left-hander. Turn one, and he's done it. Very sweet move. And look at the line of cars as they weave and bob their way down the main straight for the first time. Letting him know he's there, having oh. a go, and here's another real dart. So he, a little bit of protective driving there by Ellery. You can see how quickly uh, Stephen Richards closed up on them. That happens when the lead car decides to take evasive action or defensive action and uh, just close the bunch up. Uh, Andrew Reid still struggling a little bit there in fourth place to get onto the front Congo line. Are we Congoing or crocodiling today? <laughs> One parking out of harm's way against the wall. Can't get the number that up that on was. that one for you. First, second, third. Here's the battle for fourth. Car number 31, Andrew Reid. A linear bearing swift. And Michael Dutton is right behind him. There he goes, holding a nice line onto the straight. And 
Dutton getting ideas here on Reed. It's the only place to be. And Reed watching his mirrors drifting over to the right as he should to protect the corner, saying to Dutton, take it on the outside if you can. I'm not going to back off. And uh, he doesn't. They go around parallel. Gutsy stuff here by both drivers. But nicely done by Andrew Reed holding that fellow at bay. Michael Dutton saying, well, I'm going to have to get into that stream earlier. Still not helping himself. Tightened up on that corner and virtually ran out of road. Andrew knew where his bearings were, he clearly knew, or otherwise. He knew where he was going there, and uh, well done. Here's our race leader. They're on their last lap at the moment. Stephen Ellery in the Van Diemen, entered by Eastern Creek Raceway. He's had a yeah, perfect race. He's been able to uh, get away from both uh, Craig Lance and Stephen Richards. They've battled. Stephen Ellery doing his boss proud. He runs under the Eastern Creek banner. Mike Quinn preparing the Van Diemen. Mike's been doing a lot for the Formula Ford guys over the last few years. And certainly the chassis set up on the leading car here looks pretty strong. And Stephen's doing a great job behind the wheel as well. There he is. Nice, clean, smooth, stayed out of, stayed out of everyone's way. Ran in the clean air, got a little gap over Craig Lowndes, and that should be enough to get him through. Lowndes has uh, managed to uh, keep Stephen Richards at, uh, in check and uh, looks safe for a uh, comfortable second-place finish. Meanwhile, Andrew Reid still running in fourth and Michael Dutton in fifth. The final corner, check and flag time. And our pole sitter, Stephen Ellery, will bring them across the line, and he will win from Craig Lowndes with Stephen Richards back in third place. Fourth will go to car number 31, Andrew Reed, and fifth to Michael Dutton in car number three. Let's check them out for you on the Shell Race score as confirmed. Ellery, the winner over Craig Lowndes, Stephen Richards third, Andrew Reed fourth, Michael Dutton was fifth. So Stephen Ellery, the winner of the Motocraft Formula Ford driver to Europe round. He'll be very hard to beat in the series coming from behind. Well, just as Eastern Creek is the focal point of motorsport in Australia today, seven days ago it was both Indianapolis and Charlotte that held the attention of not only American fans, but all those Australians. For 76 years, Indianapolis on Memorial Day weekend has been the focal point of all global motorsport. The Americans like to call the Indy 500 the greatest spectacle in racing. So be it, the times are changing. Down south at Charlotte Motor Speedway in North Carolina, the most modern racing facility in the world has put Indy on notice. Charlotte might be redneck NASCAR territory, but the facilities on offer make the brickyard look fairly average. And just as Indy builds up over a month-long festival, Charlotte has responded by lighting the bank 1.5-mile oval and taking two of the major events, the Winston and the World 600, into primetime television. The Winston Classic attracted a crowd of 162,000 fans and produced a cliffhanger as Dale Earnhardt clawed his way through the pack to win a two-lap shootout with Mark Martin and a $250,000 paycheck. I dropped him a little, got a little uh, anxious there, and maybe to do it again, and well, I said, hell, I'll just raise him on the outside, and we beat him, we beat him down in three, and got by him, I don't know how I held him off. Last Sunday, 600,000 fans attended the Indy 500 and World 600 events on the same day. At Indy, Raul Bosell took the lead in the sprint of the first turn over pole sitter Ari Leyendijk and veteran Mario Andretti. One of the first to exit was Danny Sullivan, who connected with the concrete wall. Ari, Mario and Nigel led the pack. The race was relatively free of major incidents. This touch between Roberto Guerrero and Jeff Andretti giving mechanics some work, but not the medicos. Mansell was in the box seat to win Indy at his first attempt, but was caught napping on a restart as Fittipaldi and Leyendijk tore into the distance. 
Emerson went on to give Roger Penske's Marlboro team win number nine at the Indiana Oval, and naturally the Brazilian was over the moon. Well, I'm very, very pleased. I mean, it's like a dream. I remember watching Indy when I was five, six years old, and uh, to be able to win the second time was very emotional to me. It's still emotional to me now. I thought the racing wasn't as exciting. I didn't have as good time as I used to have here in the past. It was very difficult to pass. Uh, made it hard on everybody, and uh, actually it made it at times quite frustrating to, to get by a, a back marker. I mean, yeah, I'd be stuck behind a guy for 20 laps, and you'd be going nuts, but you, you know, you got to keep your composure and not uh, get too excited because that's when you got into trouble. And while Emmo was savoring win number two, they were taking the flag at Charlotte for the $1.2 million World 600 stock car race. Pole sitter Kenny Schrader led early over Mark Martin and Brett Bodine, but the man commanding all the attention was Earnhardt in the number three Goodrent Chevy. He was incredible in the traffic, but a stop and go penalty for a pit infringement put him down the field. When Rusty Wallace spun out of contention, Earnhardt closed on the leaders. But when he parked Greg Sachs 50 laps later, NASCAR penalised him a lap for being far too aggressive. That just stirred him beautifully for the remaining segment under the floodlights. Earnhardt came back through the field to win from Jeff Gordon and Dale Jarrett. The win pushed his earnings for the week to $392,000 and top of the leaderboard in the NASCAR Winston Cup point standings. I will tell you, it's, it's great winning here at Charlotte, but winning two weeks in a row under the lights here, first race under the lights, uh, the 600, and, you know, it's it's really neat to win it, but uh, to win it like we did, we had to come back from a lap down and caught a penalty there, and we, we fought back and made a lap back up, and then we came back through the field and won the race. So, no doubt about it, we had a good race car. Back here at Eastern Creek Raceway, riders moving onto the grid now for heat two of the Shell Oil Superbikes that accompany round six of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship. The lineup again, Michael Dowson, Scotty Doohan, Roy Leslie, Troy Corser, and fast qualifier Sean Giles share the front row. And out of row number two, it'll be Anthony Gobert on the Winfield Honda, Kirk McCarthy, the Suzuki, Robbie Phyllis, Ricky Rice, and Michael O'Connor. The front line is set. We're only seconds away from the start. Sean Giles on the outside, but he doesn't win the start this time. Actually, getting up smartly was Roy Leslie on the Ducati. He split the field from the front row and will lead them into the first turn. Giles away. And also heading through on the inside there, it looked like uh, Robbie Phyllis, who needed a very, very good start in this one. Up to turn number two, Roy Leslie will lead them on the Ducati. Gee, Roy's uh, really learned to get this bike off the, the line very quickly. So pole position hasn't meant too much to Sean Giles today. The Ducati sprinting away. Troy Corser in second position, and the first of the du Dukes in third as they come around the back of the circuit. Oh. So the Ducati and the Honda up now in the second, looking for the Yamahas. As we take a GIO race cam, as we ride with Michael Dowson, didn't get the best of starts. And just look at the work, how physical it is around Eastern Creek on a superbike. The massive rear tyre on the back of these things. Trying to get 140 horsepower to the ground through one tyre. Gives you an idea of just how wide they are. And the profile is designed so that they're generating just about maximum grip when they're cranked over at about 45 degrees. They sweep through the left-hander and the run downhill. Past Corporate Hill to the right-hander. Let's see what Doohan can do. Or Dowson, I should say, can do. Faints one to the outside here and tries to gather it up on the inside oh. as he gets out of the turn. The strain on these fellows' bodies, they almost three-quarters of their body weight hanging off. That left and right leg thigh must be working overtime to uh, just hang on. It's going to be close here to see whether Corsa can actually move up. Yeah, he's got uh, Scotty Doohan breathing down his neck, opens the jet, taps the Ducati side by side. Look at the grunt of this fuel injected Ducati. Unbelievable. Launches out of the corner, matches him for speed on the straight, and picks him up on turn one. Speed trap times of qualifying yesterday. Rob Phillips was doing 265 kilometres an hour down the front straight. Just an idea of how quick they turn into that turn one. It's frightening stuff. That they do it lap after lap after lap. That is moving. And Robbie hasn't had the best of uh, starts here today. Missed the kick in this one, and he's given them a good break. Oh. Whoa. See the shake they get on through the, uh, the frame. 
Leslie obviously uh, a bit uh, upset about getting nailed in the first heat, and he's saying, I want to get my lead out here as far as I can. Nobody's going to nail me on the last lap. He's doing a good job. The Ducati boys have been very strong here in uh, practice and qualifying. Roy Leslie and uh, Scotty Dewan. They've got a bit of a break over the field. Twelve months ago, remember, it was Matt Milladen riding on the Kawasaki that totally dominated the Shell Oil Superbike Series. Not so in 93. Mike, Mike Dowson uh, carrying our GIO Australia race cam, running 10th on the track at the moment on the Peter Jackson Yamaha. Chris Bombardier in front of him on bike 41, the private air Kawasaki. Oh, doesn't he get a move on out of that corner? Big jump. Oh, Dowson uh, giving away another position. Maybe in a little bit of trouble. This early stage of heat two. You can see just how close they get. The camera bringing you right into the back wheel and the back fairing and right at the end of the exhaust pipe of the Superbikes at Eastern Creek this afternoon. So there we are. Boy, Boy Leslie. Leslie. Yep, goes through, continues to lead. Fabulous job on the Ducati here today. The short straight up to turn number two. Right behind him is teammate Scotty doing. Sean Giles back there in the fourth spot. Roy seems to be like an, uh, an old wine. He just gets better with age. He's turned 37 quite recently. Still getting over injuries received in a multi-bike pile up in the opening race at Wanneroo where he suffered two crack vertebrae, a broken finger and concussion. Anything else left? <laughs> and winding up to fifth is Anthony Gobert, a, a winner of the uh, Supercross Masters, one of the most outstanding Supercross riders, having his first full season of Superbike competition. To, oh, Whoa. almost stepped off it there. Realized his mistake and let the bike go. That was uh, clever driving. Uh, maybe not such a clever uh, mistake, but uh, he certainly held it well. Could have been quite disastrous for him there. He got it off on the grass, and uh, by the time he regathered, uh, there were a couple of bikes past him on the inside. So the Dukes run uh, first and second at the moment. Here we are, half distance. Seven laps in all, and still the Ducati's running one, two. Honda. And then Yamaha. It's all starting to close up to look for uh, pole setter Sean Giles on the Peter Jackson Yamaha. Running fourth here on the road at the moment. So the Dukes, just listen to the sound of them as they come past the grandstand. Fabulous stuff. And Giles is very much on the move. Up now on the uh, tail of Troy, Troy Corsa on the, uh, the Winfield Honda. Well, when you're hot, you're hot. These guys, the main protagonists from the first team, they've bunched up again. Very evenly matched in race trip. Ducati's a tremendous uh, acceleration off the line and out of the corners. But there's nothing wrong with this RC30. Troy Corsa, you think a six-year-old bike in this company would be a very competitive tool. When you first said that, Mark, I thought, what are you talking about? How can it be six years old? That's like 60 years old. Yeah. This, uh, well, it is a six-year-old six -year design. Okay. And, uh, Honda Racing Company have been providing it with updates year to year. Doing under a little bit of pressure here from Troy Corsa on the Honda. Giles trying to get a crack at them. He's joined the draft. But oh. Roy Leslie, the race leader, has got a bit of a um, sprint along here as they come down the side of Corporate Hill to the next right-hander. This is where the Dukes have got this little advantage. Being a V-twin, they get a, uh, a weight advantage as far as the regulations are concerned over the four-cylinder Japanese bikes. Just that little extra bit of punch out of the corners when you've got a slightly better power to weight ratio. Just enough to uh, have that edge over the Japanese bikes, particularly around these constant radius corners. Well, they're using it to good, good use here today. They're strong out of here. Two laps to go as they come across the strike. Let's tight. see whether Giles can do anything. There he is running in fourth spot. The two Dukes lead the high-speed dress parade across start finishing look line. At Giles, he's sweeping up. We had a look down the inside. He had a lot of speed on there on the straight. Tucked in behind the draft, pulled his elbows in and put his head down right he's behind doing again. the RC30. Doing down the inside, couldn't do anything about that. 37-year-old Roy Leslie. He's had an atrocious season so far, as I mentioned earlier, but he's uh, getting his form back here at Eastern Creek today. Great ride on bike number two. Scotty doing playing rear gunner here on the second of the Dukes. Then the Honda of Troy Corsa and the Yamaha then of uh, Sean Giles. The 
If he's not careful, he's going to be have a short gun barrel because uh, that Winfield Honda is uh, certainly letting him know that he wouldn't mind a second spot. Just a reminder that the next round of the Australian Superbike Championship is next weekend at Lakeside, along with the 250-125 Grand Prix classes and the 600 Super Sports. 250 Proties and Sidecars, a big 12 event program at Lakeside next weekend. So, they come back toward the main straight. Positions unchanged. Ducati's looking very strong in first and second position. One lap to go. So, is Troy Corsa or Sean Giles, anything left? Doohan tucks in behind Roy Leslie. Across the start finishing line now. Last lap. Oh. Into the left hand, a flat oh, strap. Awesome speed going into that turn one. 260 clicks in a straight line. They don't back off a heck of a lot that, for the turn. That, that is bravery, City. Man. That you don't take a thing away from these fellas. That is an unbelievable act. See the back of Leslie's bike just skipping over the bumps there. Maximum traction. The tyre skipping over every little undulation on the track surface. He's skipping along through. on top of those <laughs> undulations. Thank you. Fabulous shot there as they sweep over the hump. I think it's been a fabulous idea of... Uh, Tom Smith and the Shell Company to support the Touring Car Championship at a selected number of the better racing venues this season with the Superbikes. The sprint there out of Shell Corner. And the battle continues between Roy Leslie and his Ducati teammate, Scotty Dewan. Troy Corsa on the Honda. And Sean Giles unable to do anything at this stage. In fact, they've lost uh, yeah. Sean Giles. He was on their tail half a lap ago. This is it. So it's the Red Brigade. The Ducati fans will have the Chianti glasses <laughs> clicking. We'll go and join. There's plenty of oh, there he oh, is. Uh, engine trouble, maybe, or... That's bad luck for uh, Sean Giles. Just sits there, can't believe it. He closed on them, but just couldn't capitalise at the uh, at the right moment. Our Corsa trying to sit in the draft here as they head up. He's close. For the run down to the chequered flag, he'll sit in the draft here, but I don't think there's anything he can do about the Ducati pairing. And it'll be Roy Leslie across the line to lead Scotty Doohan. And right behind them on the Honda was uh, Troy Corsa. A tremendous run between those top three. Robbie Phyllis will pick up uh, fourth spot and Anthony Gobert will get fifth. Fabulous superbike racing at Eastern Creek here this afternoon. Let's recap them for you. Leslie the winner, Scotty Doohan second, a double for the Ducatis. Troy Corsa third on the Winfield Honda. Fourth was the veteran Robbie Phyllis and fifth was Anthony Gobert back at the creek. Just a moment. And welcome back to Eastern Creek Raceway. Well, we've seen some sensational superbike racing here today. Roy Leslie and, of course, Scotty Doohan absolutely breathtaking on their Ducatis. And with Scotty Doohan, it's down to Andy Raymond. And a first and second in the superbikes has been enough to give Scotty Doohan the win. Scott, what a ride. Yeah, thanks very much. I had a pretty good start in the first one and just tried to cover myself and sort of held it there to the finish. It was pretty good. The second one was a bit harder. had to... Not, not, not so good a start, but my teammate Roy rode real good. The Ducatis performed excellent. You know, that, that was the way it turned out on the day. Scott, the superbikes, they just continue to impress. The fields are getting closer, and there's a number of guys that can win any given race. Yeah, for sure. It's been pretty close this weekend, all through qualifying. I think it was sort of uh, any one of six riders could have won the race. And like I said, with the sprint race format, it's pretty good to get a good start. Pretty uh, important to get a good start. And um, I was lucky enough to get a good start in both races. Thanks, Andy. Well, Scotty Doohan and obviously Roy Leslie have got the month off to a good start. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot more motorsport in Australia in the month of June. Next weekend, the Sprint Car Spotlight focuses on Sydney in round two of the Winged Winter Nationals at Parramatta Raceway on Sunday afternoon. Gary Rush, Brooke Tatnell and Stephen Gall head the hometowners against a big interstate cast, including Queenslanders Paul Lindbergh and John Kelly. The supporting 60-car demo derby might seem a little tame compared to the tourers, but then again, you can't have everything. Up north next Sunday, all roads lead to Lakeside for the Shell Oil Superbike Series, when Robbie Phyllis, Michael O'Connor, Roy Leslie and Mike Dowson will produce their own brand of two-wheel magic. Sunday, June 20, marks the return of the awesome V8s to Sydney's Amaru Park for round two of the 93 Amscar Championship Series. So if you missed the February opener at Rural Dural, there's no excuse this time. And still to come, round seven of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship at Adelaide's Malala Raceway on Sunday, July 4. And 
the Peter Jackson Supercross Masters goes indoors at Melbourne's National Tennis Centre on Friday and Saturday, July 9 and 10. So if you're into motor mania, that's just a sample of what's coming up over the next few weeks, coast to coast. And from what's ahead to the very present here at Eastern Creek and a parachute is landing now. The Sydney 2000 Games, the big announcement from Monte Carlo on Friday, September 24, and you'll be able to see that announcement live across the Seven Network. Dick Johnson, meantime, has fixed that broken axle. He lines up in the uh, Shell Falcon. A lot of work to do for Dick out of position number 33. And it might be timely now to take a look at the grid, how they line up. Glenn Seaton, by virtue of winning the first heat, starts off pole in the second. John Bow alongside in the Shell Falcon EB. Out of row two, it's Alan Jones in 35 and Wayne Gardner in the Telecom Mobile Ed Commodore. Tiny Longhurst then in the Benson and Hedges BMW. From six, it's 11. Larry Perkins, the Castrol Commodore. Peter Brock in 05. The Mobile One Commodore out of seven. From eight, Paul Morris, the Diet Coke BMW. Jimmy Richards in the Winfield Commodore. Car two out of nine. And Jeff Full, the Diet Coke BMW. Car number 24 out of position number 10. And drama already for Peter Brock. The 05 Commodore has pulled off the starting grid and comes into the pits. Some problems for uh, Peter Brock, whether or not he's going to uh, change a tyre or not. Brock there with the mechanics. Andy Raymond is down at the pits. Yes, Peter Brock is actually going to start from pit lane. The crew has figured out they are going to change all four tyres, but they are not going to do it before the green light comes on. So, in fact, Peter Perfect will be starting from pit lane. Well... Thanks for the update on that. They wheel the tyres out, a bewildering one, Alan Moffat, but we have the field just about set to go. Ten seconds away from the start. Lonely spot for Dick Johnson, the rear of the field up front. Glenn Seaton and John Bauer ready to scream off into the distance and Alan Jones ready to win the start. They get off the line. Wayne Gardner separates them and switches to the outside as he and Jones go after it into the first corner. That's brought the fans alive here at Eastern Creek. Glenn Seaton has won the battle to turn number one, but right behind him, Wayne Gardner got off the line like a rocket ship. Beautiful start. There's John Bauer. Tony Longhurst back in behind him. Look at the charge of the BMWs. They did well in the first heat, and they've started off a great position, well up in the top ten for the second. Keep an eye out for Dick Johnson and Mark Scave too. They're charging through for the back of the grid on fresh tyres. It's going to be quite a charge. Here comes Jones down the inside of Wayne Garner. Moment of truth for our two world Formula champions, motorcycles and Formula One. 35, Alan Jones makes his way past, and that puts Garner now back into the clutches of a horde of BMWs. It's tough, aggressive stuff at the front. Seaton leads Alan Jones through, and Wayne Garner. Look at the BMW, Paul Morris in the coke car. The John Bow rounding up the top five as they sweep through the back of the circuit for the first time. Well, Johnson has already passed any number of cars. We'll follow his progress as they come down the side of Corporate Hill to the very tight right-hander. Glenn Seaton, the Peter Jackson. Oh! That's not where you go, and John Bauer will close that up on the inside. Fans in the grandstand thought that was just wonderful. Big drag race on the back straight, and they get the power down on the Chevy and the Ford V8 is side by side. So they swing through the switchback. Gardner gets pushed wide again. He's dropped two positions. He's gone way off the racing line. All sorts of trouble. Well, Wayne Gardner's race, uh, a chance of a placing over quite early. And the crowd get to their feet as they come past the grandstand for the first time. It's Seaton and a huge roar. Alan Jones in second place. The BMW in third and John Bow in fourth. Despite what the critics say of this formula, the fans have never had it so good. They just stand and cheer with the Falcons and the Holdens going head to head down the front straight. There's Neil Crompton, the GIO Commodore. Into turn number two, John Bow. And our race leader, Glenn Seaton. Let's have a replay of the start of the race from Dick Johnson's uh, Dunlop race camp off the starting line. Now, he started dead last in this one. There's a passage down the inside. Goodbye, boys. And here he is down on the inside of Bob Forbes' car. So he's picked up six or seven. Now it gets tight at the front end of the field. There's a little opening down there. Kept we'll clear the line. lens for you. Got a bit of mud on his windscreen there from the Holden. So Glenn Seaton continues and Wayne Gardner has gone back into the pits, I'd say, uh, for some tyres. It didn't look too good there. He was uh, swaying from one side of the track to the other. He may have had a puncture. This certainly the... didn't have his car under control. Two laps for Dick Johnson, position 33 to 11. The man of the match, Glenn Seaton. 
a nice clean run in the opening heat, so I'd say his tyres are in very good condition. The car's proved it uses his tyres well through race distances. And we'll just see how comfortable seat is when we compare race times in the second heat. Here's Scape coming through. Looking good already past Mazzara. So Holden team with fresh tyres, off they go. Brock is already gone and in a way. He got a good uh, stunt that he pulled there, putting tyres on at the start of the race. Here we are, David and Goliath, shades of 92. The little 2.5 litre BMW taking on the 5 litre Falcon V8. Big power versus small power, but there's no lack of speed from this BMW. Look at the way it hooks into this left-hander, cornering like it's on rails. Bow's going to have his work cut out for him. And he passed this little German coupe. Jeff Hall, car number 23. Right behind uh, Morris, of course, is uh, John Bauer in the number 18 Shell Falcon. Well, John won't like that too much. He'll be trying to set him up. He'll have to get a little bit closer to do it if he's planning to. The great tyre war continues in 93 as well. The two leading Peter Jackson cars on Bridgestone rubber. Paul Morris, the first of the Yokohama cars. And, of course, uh, John Bauer on the Dunlop shot, shot Shell Falcon. So, big variety of rubber companies at the front. There's his teammate. Blanchard sneaks through. Mark Scaife. Tremendous charge from Scaife on fresh tyres. Scaife has been outstanding. He's he come sure from has. the back of the field to position seven so far. So he is hauling the mail big time. Closing up on the Bimmers. We saw on the replay, made a sensational start. We looked out of uh, Johnson's race camp. You can see they were moving in tandem. Scaife got an excellent bolt off the line. Pushed his way past probably six or seven cars. And now he is the leading pack. Well, Thomas Mazzera, car number 15. And there's Wayne Gardner giving way to the fast cars who go around the outside of him. He's back on fresh rubber. 25, Tony Longhurst now has uh, Mark Scaife coming at him from all angles at the moment. They come down the front straight. Let's have a look at the horsepower difference. Well, it's a drag race. And Got him. no shortage of grunt from the V8. It's been quoted somewhere in the region of 550 horsepower out of the uh, Chevs and Chev units and the Commodores this year. Tony Longhurst couldn't quite match that in a straight line as we take Dunlop race camp. Board Dick Johnson's Falcon. Dick on the charge through the field as well. Gardner back into the pits for another stop, so something is not right with the uh, number 16 Telecom Mobile Net Commodore. Started brilliantly, but uh, something's gone away on the car, and here he comes. The air line at the very front of the car. Pops. Oh. Look at this. John Bowles finally got his way past Paul Morris. Wayne Gardner headed into the pits, so it's V8s 123 again at the front of the pack. BMW splitting from fifth place. Brock, who started from uh, pit lane with a fresh set of tyres up to 17th, so he gave away a lot at the start. And here comes Morris down again, just oh. chipping away, but he locks up the front. <laughs> it's locked it up, but it's in the air, yeah. Mike, and he's not actually flat spotting it. So that's the good way to conserve that's a, rubber. Out. A very good way to uh, be able to uh, have your brakes on and not lock your tyres up. Just an indication of how stiffly they set these BMWs up. Well, it's good to see him giving his sponsors Diet Coke a good run here today at Eastern Creek. They've been slim picking so far this season. Look at the massive wing on the back of this BMW. This is running full German touring car spec. A lot of downforce, and obviously the kit works fairly well in a straight line because they managed to hang on to the V8s. Uh, they don't lose a lot of ground as they come to this long straight. Hardly losing anything, man. It's, uh, then accelerates through the left-hander off the main straight, which is uh, a real G-force city. Here's Johnson on the charge, following through the Winfield cars as he makes his way through the pack as well. Larry Perkins going in deep. Right behind him is Thomas Mazzera. They're closing just a little on Tony Longhurst. There's Tony going through in the Benson and Hedges BMW. Perkins in the Castrol Commodore. And then Dick Johnson threading his way through the needle. Johnson is now up to 10th. Good run there by Dick, looking good. Not a good run today for uh, Wayne, Wayne Gardner, but uh, his teammate, Thomas Mazzera, not doing a bad job at all. There's piles of smoke pouring out the back of the uh, number 15 Commodore, certainly on trailing throttle. We noticed that with Wayne Gardner's car earlier, but Thomas's car seems to be blowing an excessive amount of smoke. He's been doing that all weekend, though. Mm. To the right-hander at the end of Corporate Hill. Jimmy Richards, car number two, in behind Thomas Mazzera. Dick Johnson's come up from the back of the field and sits on the tail of those Commodores. 
and they are just behind Tony Longhurst BMW. Let's go down to the pits to Andy Raymond with Wayne Gardner. Yes, a very disappointed Wayne Gardner. They thought you just had a punch of Wayne, but it's a little more than that. Yeah, I got shunted off by John Bow, and um, when we came together, my tyre uh, was cut up from his and um, punctured, and then also you bent my steering, so I shot off the track. They put another tyre on, and um, it wasn't steering straight, so I called it a day. You didn't realise you had the steering problem when you first came in? No, I thought it was all the steering wasn't right because of the flat tyre. Uh, but when I put another tyre on, it wasn't steering straight, and it's too dangerous to continue. OK, thank you, Andy, with uh, Wayne Gardner. Very disappointed because he made a brilliant start here and looked very, very professional here today, Alan. Yes, he did, and uh, he, he waited, made a wise decision. You can't fool around with a car that's capable of the speeds that the Commodores are doing here today and be wondering about your steering. So as disappointed as he is, uh, I think he was wise in uh, parking it. How close. That's the way Brooks you go by it. when you're in a two-liter car, and uh, Dick just uh, took his door handles off as he went by. Dick's doing a fabulous job here, and Dunlop Race Cam shows you at home exactly what's happening as he tries to close now. Oh, as he squeezes through. But Larry's got the right line for the next turn. Oh, yes, and the brakes as well. Goes very deep. Blocks his tracks. Jim Look, Richards follows Jimbo. him for good yes, measure. Dang. Just keep it up, Larry. Held it under control there. Nicely done. Now, Thomas will have to do that all over again down the front straight. He's dived in again. There's no passing room through uh, the series of corners. Let's see how much power he has. They come back onto the start finishing straight. So, the Jimmy Richards, one of the cleanest racers in the business. We were commenting earlier in the weekend. He's probably one of the one or two cars this year that hasn't had a body altercation. Running door to door with these guys, he's still one heck of a clean racer. Thomas going for the outside. Has been passed, but comes back, gets on the brakes early. That's where he went off yesterday. Uh, he knows where to hit them this yep. time. Man. You got plenty of practice yesterday. He certainly knows where the shutoff point is there, and that was a good move. Car number 30, Glenn Seaton continues to lead as we check them out for you on the Shell race score. Seaton the leader over Alan Jones in the 35, Peter Jackson Falcon. Third is John Bow in the Shell Falcon. Fourth is Paul Morris in the Diaco BMW. And now fifth, car number one, Mark Scaife in the Winfield Commodore. Tony Longhurst, car number 25, tries to hold out the challenge now from Larry Perkins in the Castrol Commodore. Perkins has been gaining on the Little Bimmer, and Thomas Mazira sits in behind him. Nothing between them. We'll see uh, what squirt advantage the, uh, the V8s have over uh, Tony's very, very quick uh, M3 next time they come down the straight. I'm quite impressed the way the tyres are hanging in on the V8s, Alan. Uh, this stage of the race, after one 16 lap heat and the terse action in this uh, second heat, yes, they, they seem are. to be hanging on to the BMW quite effectively. The, the fellows that have uh, driven each heat with a, with a view to uh, capitalising on each lap have done extremely well. Uh, the, the, the cars that started at the back of the field with fresh tyres I don't think can be considered totally on their merits. And uh, here we have the advantage of the BMW with only a thousand uh, kilograms against 1300 kilograms in the V8s. In the second heat there, certainly Tony's whipping this thing around at halftime uh, to the GIO. delight of our statistician. Uh, GIO race cam traveling with Neil Crompton. Hasn't been the best of weekends, but Neil didn't finish the first heat this morning. Fifth fastest on Friday, qualified around about 12, and now running position 13 in the second heat today. Still with a lot of work to do running the, uh, the Holden engine, and I'll be doing uh, a move up to the, uh, the Chevy-based uh, unit a little later in the season. Getting tight up here as Larry Perkins hammers away at Tony Longhurst. Thomas Mazira is trying to pass Perkins. Dick Johnson is joining onto the end of this queue. So it's all happening here at Eastern Creek Raceway. Mazzara will remember the last time that he got up alongside the Castro Commodore. It was at the end of the straight at Phillip Island. Larry didn't give way, and uh, Thomas came off second best. So he'll be thinking twice about exactly where he decides to pass Larry here, if indeed he can. Well, on that occasion, he had Bass Strait to stop him. Now he's only got Rooty Hill and Blacktown. <laughs> it's a little different, the terrain at Eastern Creek. Very, very fast. Great run here too from Jeff Fall in the second of the Coke BMWs. 
I think Coke have got a good run considering it's their first year uh, in many years. Uh, thinking back to uh, my Trans Am Mustang days, uh, that uh, Coke have been back in the field and uh, they should be very pleased with the uh, level of preparation and uh, excitement that the little uh, Coke BMWs have uh, exerted on the field. The case will be at the door tomorrow. They come out of the top corner on the way down the front straight. Dick Johnson has Peter Brock. Brock's been gaining. Brock is up to 12. Johnson 11. Keep in mind, Johnson started tail of the field. Brock started in pit lane with fresh rubber, making a heavy move through the field as we watch Dick Johnson in a study of concentration here as he moves around in the seat a little at the end of the front straight. And that's back inside Brock. Look at the outside of Johnson's car, 17. Dick's had a wretched weekend. He uh, had a nasty crash on Friday, misunderstanding with Larry Perkins, and apparently the chassis telemetry from the Shell team said he hit the wall about 180 clicks, which never does uh, much good to a new Shaz Allen. Not at all. You don't like to hit them that hard. A couple of scrapes or a little bit of body damage, a door handle or two, squeeze, as we squeeze. have a Commodore sneaking up alongside here, Cheeky Brocky, <laughs> but he's on the wrong side, side of the circuit. Dick's not having any of that, but uh, good driving there, Peter. Hung on to it. He didn't go extra wide. Well, these two guys will run door handle to door handle and they won't touch each other. Oh, Peter's never been renowned for being uh, a back uh, seat basher. He's uh, always uh, given everybody a hard time, but uh, a very sporting driver. Here he comes onto the straight. These two great protagonists. Sees a bit of smoke in front of him, wonders what to do there. He's backed off a little bit extra. Now again, accelerating in tandem with the Falcon in front. They were the great adversaries in the uh, early 80s in Falcons and Commodores, and here we are 10 years later, and nothing's changed. Ford versus Holden, Brock versus oh, Johnson. Johnson a runs a little bit wide. Big flames coming out of the exhaust on trailing throttle. We go back inside Dick's car, and Brock is filling up the mirrors of the 17 car well and truly as he tucks under the wing for the run down the main straight. Knocks his way through the Hollinger box. Bang into sixth gear. Top Doesn't speed past the grandstand. Oh, as Thomas Mazira comes up on the inside of Tony Longhurst and passes him. Well, every time these flock of cars come past the grandstand, the uh, crowd is standing to their feet. Absolutely engrossed in the battle happening here. Great variety of cars as Brock finally gets his way past Johnson. Well done. He's been hammering away at the back of the shell car for a couple of laps. So Brock's initiative of starting from uh, pits on new tyres seems to be paying off at this stage of the race. He pushes his way through. So Brock hard at work in the office of 05 we've seen so many times before. Brock is 10th uh, on the road at the moment. Yes, I think he's got to on his uh, measure here. It'll only be a question of getting rid of these sh sharp uh, horseshoe corners. He's and through. He's, he's already through. I think there must be something wrong with Tony. I don't think he could be nailed well, Tony, that easily. Well, and truly opened the door then. Yes. As we go with Tony's car once again, sump cam under the tail of 05. Just see how hard these V8s are working. Brock on off the brakes, getting the power on. Look at the oversteer and understeer as he yeah. balances the car on the throttle, bring it onto the straight as fast as he can. Longhurst, no match for him in a straight line. Gets the power down to the mobile chef. Three laps to go as they bring them across the start finishing line. Brock, he's the hero today. Yeah, they love him. He's the man of the match. Big charge from the mobile car. Brock's been on a high all weekend. As soon as he got these new aerodynamic devices onto the car, he's a lot more confidence. Very quick in qualifying. Well back into the top six. And uh, licking his lips for Bathurst. I'm sure he's looking forward to the mountain this year. Well, I don't think there'd be a Commodore driver out there after today's exercise that wouldn't be looking forward to Bathurst, Mark. They've got a lot of time now to uh, refine their chassis around these new wings. And uh, we haven't seen the last of the uh, Commodore Brigade in terms of uh, equalizing the competition. And this dice between Paul Morris and John Bauer continues. Scaife probably about the same distance back with two and a half laps remaining. This has shades of last year event. I remember uh, John Bauer in the Sierra and Tony Longhurst in the BMW. Terrifying him around the back part of the circuit. And, uh, a lot of us were convinced that Longhurst was going to get through, but Bauer is a master around this place. And he'll make life very, very tough for Morris in these closing few laps. Two laps to go this time. The two Peter Jackson Falcons of Glenn Seaton and Alan Jones go across the line. Then it's John Bow in third place. Behind him, Paul Morris, then Mark Scaife in the Winfield number one Commodore. Well, without doubt, the best finish for Paul Morris uh, of his career to date. Looking extremely good here today. Holding up the BMW Ford uh, and 
and a fine fourth overall. Can be sneezed at. Well, the status quo remains. Falcons 1, 2, 3, despite the aerodynamic boost for the Commodores. It's been a big improvement for the Holden boys, but obviously not enough. This is the race package of 93. Glenn Seaton and Alan Jones and the Peter Jackson Falcons, they really are a class act. Well, we mustn't discount that act either, Mark. That's a fact. It's a, it's a team that is able to produce two cars. By produce, I mean make and prepare two cars and get them out on the track and run one, two like this. This is a tremendous achievement. It's hard enough to get one car to the track. It's hard enough to get one car to the start line. It's hard enough to get one car to the finish line. To do it with two is a tremendous credit to Glenn Seaton, his father, and the whole team. Well, if they finish this way, according to uh, Nigel Greenway, our statistician, it gives Glenn the win for the day. We'll move John Bauer to second and Alan Jones to third overall. And if Glenn was to ease up and let uh, his team partner, Alan Jones, win this heat... Let's not go too far. <laughs> he will. That would make it a one-two. No, he's not even interested in it. Haven't seen him look in the mirror for four laps. No, look at the no. crowd. He's... He's high slap. He might crash here if he keeps looking in the rear view anymore. There's the gap back to John Bow and Paul Morris, followed by uh, Mark Scape. And further back up the hill, it's Larry Perkins, Thomas Mazira, and Peter Brock closing like all hell behind the two of them. Well, Seaton comes out about eight seconds mid-race. He's let, lessened that gap back a little bit. It was the easing off as the uh, coming to the final lap. And it would appear things are well under control for Seaton and the Peter Jackson team once again. There's Brocky. And having the grandstand be behind this man in the second heat. Well, he's now up behind Thomas Mazira, but I think he's run out of time. And Thomas is sitting under the... Uh, the shadow of uh, Larry Perkins. They've had a fabulous drive. Now, the spectators have seen plenty of passing here today with the big V8s. And commiserations to uh, Wayne Gardner, who uh, looked like he was in this with a very, very big chance. <laughs> Larry takes the uh, conservative line, shall we say. Oh, Thomas almost locked up a break there. And Brocky's there to pick up the pieces in case they both uh, get off onto the wrong line. Just not quite enough real estate there for him to capitalize on that good slipstream that he got behind Mazzara. But not to say that he hasn't got designs on a better finish still. <laughs> Here we go through the office window. Yeah, come out wide, go in through, slam her down into second. Oh, there's a battle of pride at stake here too. This is going to be the fastest Commodore run at Eastern Creek. So one of these three wants to take it. Last corner comes up now as Glenn Seaton and Alan Jones right behind him. He eases it up as Jones comes across the outside. They're going to have a form finish. One, two across the line. Seaton wins it. Jones finishes in second. John Bow is going to get third, followed by Paul Morris. A fabulous finish and a great day for uh, the Peter Jackson team of Glenn Seaton and Alan Jones. Let's check them out on the Shell Race score, confirming Glenn Seaton and teammate Alan Jones are 1-2 in round six. John Bow and the Shell Falcon EV finishes third. Paul Morris, a great fourth place in the Diet Coke BMW and rounding out the five in one Mark Scape, the Winfield Commodore. Back here at Eastern Creek Raceway, the winner of the two-litre series today is Colin Bond and the Caltex Toyota. All the best, Colin. You've had a good day. A lot of cars passed you, too. <laughs> well, they did, actually, Mike, but I must admit, we came with a brand-new motor car on Friday. I hadn't turned a wheel, and for the win first time out, I think, is a great lot of credit to the boys. And obviously, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Caltex and Toyota, for all their help through the year. OK, all the best to you. Third overall in points today for the Peter Jackson team, and he was rear gunner in the second heat, Alan Jones! Well done, AJ. That was a super drive. The weekend worked out OK. Yeah, all was well. It ends well. We lost the plot a bit uh, Friday and Saturday, and I think I lost my way a bit. Then we put the car back to the way we, the old faithful way. It's always been good, and it, uh, it went fantastic. So Ford still reigns. OK, thanks, Alan. Congratulations. Second overall in points today for the Shell team, John Bauer of Tasmania. Well done, John. It was a pretty tough day out there. It certainly was, Mike. The car was uh, going really well and we got some new Dunlop tyres and they were much better than the last lot, lot we had. And uh, I must congratulate Paul Morris. He drove a fantastic race, very tidy, and uh, he's a, a coming lad, no risk. Look forward to your performance at the Galar at Malala. <laughs> Thanks, mate. OK, and the winner overall in points today still leads the championship by an even bigger margin, but no-one would be upset about that. Glenn Seaton for the Peter Jackson team. Congratulations, pal. You've done marvellously well today. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think early in the year when we came back here for the Triple Challenge has really paid off because we learned a lot then. And I'd just like to thank my team, um, Peter Jackson, STP and Bridgestone for the fantastic tyres and the boys that worked on the cars. <laughs>